I'm Jamie, and I'll just get everybody to, to mute yourself if you can. Uh, I'm Jamie, and I'm with the PAC representing. Uh, I'm a board member, and uh, I'm a, a PAC certified provider as well since 2018. And I've just been excited to be on this journey of learning and, and getting to know many other professionals and whatnot. Um, this is absolutely exciting to have you all on here today. So we're going to get started. I have a short little presentation to kind of explain to you what PAC is all about, as many of you may not know uh, much about PAC or who we are or what we are and what our purpose is. So I'm going to share my screen and do a quick little presentation for you. And then I'm going to pass it off to Tom, who is here. And this is who you're all really wanting to see. And then we'll get started with his presentation shortly after. But let's learn a little bit of PAC first. All right, so welcome everyone. What is PAC? So PAC is a nonprofit and we're primarily an all volunteer organization. And our mission really is bringing independent testing and certification to the pet care services. Our veterinarian clinic has it, our dog training has it, um, but our, our boarding services and our daycare services, our dog walkers and, and whatnot, the pet care services, this is the first one and and we're very excited to be to be able to um, present that and offer that. Um, so it's independent certification for a very rapidly growing industry where it's very easy to enter and it gets damaged on the daily um, by by serious accidents and deaths for those that um, don't have the certification or don't have the requirements and the knowledge of, of how to take care of pets properly. Um, so these professionals that pass the certification, they go through stringent testing uh, and it just reflects their base of knowledge. Um, and then as well, they have to continue education. So every time uh, since 2018, I've had to recertify every three years, which is important. And during that time frame, I have to uh, collect CEUs. And today we do have a CEU for everybody here that is PAC certified. We'll have a CEU um, on the presentation. So stick around for that. Uh, so you have access to that and you can add it into your portal on our website. Um, so third party certification versus the certificate program, uh, the difference is really important and PAC is a third party certification. So what is that difference? Um, typically, a second party would be, you know, you go to school, you, you do a course and you get a certificate after that. So it results from an educational process where a third party, it is an assessment process. So it's a third party council that tests your requirements. It doesn't matter where you get the school from, we test your requirements uh, in order to pass the certif certification and it's third party, so it's unbiased. And, it, and it's all created by professionals in our industry. Um, so a certificate is for newcomers and experienced professionals where a third party certification typically re requires some sort of professional experience. So there are requirements for each level um, in order for you to take the exam. Um, a certificate is awarded by educational program providers. It indicates completion of a course, like I had mentioned before, where a third party is awarded by a third party standard setting organization. It indicates mastery or competency as a measurement against a defensible set of standards. Um, so it usually on a certificate is listed on a resume detailing education um, where you'll see it kind of as a document hanging on the wall, which you can see uh, several of mine. Um, I'm a professional a certified professional dog trainer and behavior consultant as well. So you'll see that behind me um, and a third party. It's um, it's a document again, but it's something that it it doesn't, uh, or sorry, it does expire where a regular certificate never expires. You did the course once, off you go. With a third party certification, you have to continually renew that and it comes with an expiry date. With the regular certificate, the end result demonstrates knowledge of the course, which is really important. Um, with third party, you have your ongoing requirements in order to maintain and hold that uh, certificate and demonstrate that you know the current um, information that that is needed in our industry. Third party uh, is it also has no relationship with attaining higher education or degree, meaning um, 
with a certificate, you can continue going to school and whatnot and can continue getting certificates. With a third party, you're just obtaining CEUs to create and hold that certification um, process. So that kind of gives you a little bit of the difference between the two. Why would it be important to your business? Well, most professions require independent certification. Uh, if you go to the dentist, they have to have third party certification in order to hold license to maintain your edge in an increasing competitive market. Again, we talk about how easy it is to get into the pet care industry. Just the idea of I love pets is just not enough today. Um, it builds confidence with your employees, um, understanding and knowing your knowledge and skill set. It's a documented commitment to excellence, safety, and continued education, which to me is, is the most uh, important, um, especially for my clients being in the classroom. Potential to recruit higher quality employees. That's a really great benefit for your business. Building trust with your pet parents. Again, um, knowing that there is something that they can you know, feel comfortable with and they know, hey, this person that I'm hiring absolutely has this knowledge because a third body counsel has um, tested that that knowledge. It's not just firsthand knowledge saying, yep, I, I took the course and, and I think I'm really good. It goes beyond that. So we kind of ask, especially professionals, we ask yourself two questions. Do you know what you're doing when it comes to for, um, caring for people's pets? You might already be in business and I've been in business for 30 years. Are you good at what you do? And if you answer yes to both those questions, then we just say kind of prove it. Why are you not certified then? Why do you not go that extra, that extra mile and really showcase what it is that you know and, and become part of that higher standard uh, quality of care? So our next exam date, if you're interested and you're not certified yet, uh, we'd love to have you part of the PAC family. Our next exam is November 5th to the 19th. However, October 12th is the registration deadline. Uh, so we like to get you to start that process now because months do go by fast. Uh, after the summer, the fall hits, and uh, depending on where you are in the world, um, and, and it's easy to forget. Uh, you can join our Facebook study group as well, and you'll find it uh, on Facebook under the PAC exam study group. Here is some links to help you stay connected as well, and I'll add them into the chat uh, once Tom gets started, and then you'll have access to that as well. Um, that's it. So now I just, you know, I have to welcome Tom. Uh, we're going to do questions in the chat box. So we wanted this to be a little bit more interactive than we normally do our presentations. Um, but to make things really go smoothly and and uh, allow Tom to just kind of get his information out and share all his knowledge for us, we'll get questions in the chat box. I will go through them. And at the end of the um, presentation, we'll have time for those questions and everything. So I'm going to stop sharing and pass this off to Tom so that he can share and uh, we'll get started. Thank you so much, everyone, and enjoy our presentation. Thank you so much, Tom. Oh, sure, sure. Um, I am, let me get my computer up here. It was just kind of, of course, oh my word. <laughs> we were, uh, I lost Zoom on my, here, there we go. We just did right? this. We just did this three minutes ago, and right? now that's how it always works. Just hold on, everybody. We'll get started in just one second. I see so much sunshine. Everybody is for those that are on that I can see. I see lots of sunshine. That's nice. Okay, now we should. There we go, Tom. You got it. Okay, so you, now you see my screen. Yeah. Okay, let me get rid of this there. Still see my screen? Yep, you're all good. Awesome. Good answer. Good whenever answer. you are. Okay, sure. Let me, yeah, how about the, <laughs> this thing here? So, well, where do we want to start here? Did you, number one, thank you guys for having us here. Um, welcome to all my pet tech instructors. I see just a list of them over there, Karen. <laughs> uh, so, the genesis of this talk here, um, and yeah, we'll take the chats. I'll get my chat up on the side here. Was that um, you know, as many of you know, uh, um, I originally trained at the Michigan State Police underwater recovery. Put myself through college working for dozens of ambulance services, and then forward a few too many years and not enough beers, as I like to say. Um, that uh, uh, I was affiliate faculty at the cardiac cardiac training center at Sharp Gross One Hospital. It was a power of one question that was that started all of pet tech. And I was teaching a class for the city of San Diego, a human CPR class. And the guy comes up and he goes, hey, Tom, it's a really good class, but will this work on my dog? And 
I went cha-ching. I'm just kidding. I went ding, ding, ding. <laughs> I prefer the cha-ching. And um, I went, there was a business here. So I went back to school and I got my certifications in uh, veterinary assistance one and two, and I was going to go further. But then we had veterinarians who serve in our advisory council and whatnot. And, and as all of our instructors really know, you know, our big Bible is this guy right here. Um, because everything we do dovetails and supports this, which is what the uh, uh, veterinarians would be using there. So let, I, I think most people may know a little bit about me there. So I just want to keep moving here. And I do have, I apologize in advance because I have to toggle back and forth between my remote and my mouse. Um, so number one is at Pet Tech. We're proud to be a platinum sponsor with Pet Tech. And ever since Charlotte Briggs, you know, <laughs> I remember meeting Charlotte Briggs, I think it was IVPSA. And before we even done talking, we're like, uh, yeah, we're all in. <laughs> we were in before we even got onboarded <laughs> with PAC, which was kind of cool. So, no, we're very super excited because another really cool thing is that um, not only is our pet saver training, which is our eight hour course, and our pet first aid training, you know, which is a four to five hour course, depending on your class size and whatnot, um, that uh, you're getting CEUs for that. And we have, that has been that way for quite a while. Well, that's pretty, pretty cool because now we have CEUs for our pet tech instructor training, for our three day instructor training. So that, and uh, I think as I was talking to Stephanie, if you take our instructor training, you, I think you get enough CEUs like for a year or two or something like this to keep you going. So that's cool. However, all you get today is one CEU for listening to me. So, but I do appreciate the opportunity to share our message uh, with you. And uh, so uh, moving right along here, our pets, they can't talk, but there is a lot to write about when it comes to them. And you know, there's a lot to keep track of too. And especially as we professionalize this in industry, because it is a professional industry and it is something that we can all make a professional income from. And that's what we need to teach. Uh, have professional practices and good record keeping is probably tantamount or, or number one there and being in tune with your pet's daily routine is something that we've been teaching for a long time and it's the key to identifying the earliest signs of any kind of serious illness or disease okay and uh, we pet tech has always promoted having a pet health journal and uh, that's why we actually created our own health and activity journals and those will be coming out but we'll tell you more on that a little bit later so our question today is how are you listening to your pet? You know, pet tech, we listen with our head, our hands, and our heart. And I have to toggle these things, which is not right. Um, so we teach it with your head, your hands, and your heart because there's very subtle clues and cues that our pets give to us that we should never ignore. And that's the, the motif or the theme through this entire presentation. These are the things you should never ignore. Now, you may, you may just be blessed and lucky and you may never come across any of these. And the thing is, knowledge is power. And that's why we know that all these changes are made through education, okay? So the, the thing is, I think it's Drucker who said it, is that some things, um, uh, uh, no, I, uh, we teach, some things only show up through time, but he said, if you can't measure it, you can't manage it. So sorry to get that little quote out, I'm a big fan of quotes. So now that we've noticed something different, what could be the cause of the cause, which is kind of stepping behind the veil, if you will, a little bit, okay? Because pets do communicate, you know, using behavior, signs, and indicators. And it could be psychological, which is the first one on the left there. And that is the pet is stressed. It's panting excessively. Let's say if that's one of the signs. Uh, you know, why is he doing that? It could be because of thunder and lightning. And this is like a mental and emotional cause, you know, not a physical cause for that behavior. So we put it in that column there, the, psychology, the psychological. Um, the next one could be a situational cause, such as like, well, those that have taken my class, they know that I say every class, shit happens outside the litter box. And that's just the circumstantial or the situational um, that occurs. And so again, if it's not for this unfortunate circumstance, you know, the, the pet would have been okay. And then, and that, that's, that's the mainstream of our business right there, pet tech, right? <laughs> With uh, accidents do happen. Okay. And then the next one could be a uh, medical, you know, if the pet's drinking more water, you know, it could be the beginning of early stages of diabetes or something like that. And that's where a physical illness or an injury is the one that affects the behavior uh, of the pet. So the top things to never ignore. These are the things you should never ignore. Now, let me kind of give you a, like a little a POV, a point of view here. These, these are the big guys we're going to talk about. We're going to take each one of these topics and then break it down and look for these three reasons we talked about, you know, the um, psychological, situational, and medical, about why those could be the, the cause, 
Okay. So, I, you know, if your pet's having trouble breathing, well, that's not normal, right? Duh. And if your pet's a voracious eater, you know, and they don't even want to treat, well, there's something not right there either. And if your pet can't even jump up or down on the bed anymore, well, there's something really not right with that pet in our house. <laughs> so that's our pet sleep uh, with us and some, sometimes between us, right? Um, but, but seriously, they could have a joint issue or something like that. But, you know, if Fluffy is really cute and cuddly, you know, now she's snappy, you know, she could be in pain or something. What's the cause of that behavior change? Number four there. And then the last one is, you know, abnormal. There's something abnormal about it. Going back to the Young Frankenstein uh, uh, show. So if your cat's shedding excessively, that could be a sign, sign of illness as well. So the first one, the first topic that I went before was changes in breathing. So now we never want to ignore under the changes in breathing. We never want to ignore excessive panting, which kind of referenced that a minute ago, labored breathing, shallow breathing, that reverse sneeze, um, or even that, that noisy breathing. Okay. So I remember in, in my class one time, there was a lady who, I don't know if you've ever, I'm sure you've all seen in your life like a reverse sneeze, right? Um, and I remember I had a lady in my class one time, the first time she saw it, it freaked her out. She took her dog to the vet. She signed up for a pet tech course. We like that. Here, we'll do it this way. I like that. <laughs> signed up for a pet tech course. And we talked to her about a pet health journal. She did that. She wrote it down. And she discovered that it was nothing more than the days that she was using hairspray, the dog was doing the reverse sneeze. Because the dog would lay in the bottom, lay in the bottom, lay in the, on the floor in the bathroom, you know, while she was getting ready for work. And that spray was actually an irritant on the nasal pharynx, okay, causing that reverse sneeze. So again, if it wasn't for that situation, it, it wouldn't have happened. And as we teach in our programs, you know, a pet's breathing should be smooth, rhythmic, and easy, and between 10 to 30 breaths per minute, and that's what's considered normal. So anything other than that, we should all have say it in unison. Should not be ignored, <laughs> right? Uh, the, the next one here is the excessive panting around here is a psychological, you know, there's a columns there, you can see those. What we did is we bolded the ones that I was going to like briefly address, or it could be number one. Now there, these are not in a true hierarchy, so don't think that, you know, one of these is, has, carries any more weight. Sure, some may be more common than others, or you know, statistically probable. Um, but panting, panting is normal. That's, that's how pets cool themselves. We discuss this in our, in our trainings, because uh, sometimes they, the pet parents just don't know that they don't know. But excessive panting is definitely not something to ignore, you know, especially if it goes on for too long or, or, or too long. And um, excessive panting could be caused by fireworks. If your pet's panting excessive, it could be come from heat stroke. You know, there's all these reasons to come on. There's even cardiac fatigue, which can cause excessive panting. And that can actually occur in the middle of the night. We recently had somebody in the class that, that brought this into our awareness a little bit more. And um, in, in the, the um, exercise intolerance it can be pretty bad. I mean, just an excessive exercise wouldn't they could collapse, which would not be a good thing, you know, if you're taking care of somebody's pet. Okay. Um, I thought, so, so the next one is uh, labored and or shallow breathing. And these are true indicators that something's maybe not going right with, with your pet. Um, and in most cases, the issues with breathing like this, it's really not psychological. It's not, you know, I'll breathe slow. <laughs> but, you know, it could be situational if the pet was poisoned, the one we have highlighted there. Um, if they got into antifreeze or some other kind of poison, uh, that could definitely, as the pet takes effect on the body, it could slow things down and it could make their breathing more labored and shallow with the potentiality of it coming to a stop altogether which that's kind of the definition of a poison, you know, or, you know, medically speaking, they have a, a lung infection, pneumonia, chronic bronchitis, kennel cough. I mean, do I need to go on for those that have a big brick and mortar? Because you know what we're talking about there. Good boy, I get to use my remote. Um, that reverse sneeze, yay, we kind of started out with that one there. Um, but that really is an irritation of that airway, as I talked about. Um, it's a, let me get it right here for you. It's a spasm of the muscles of the pharynx. Um, it's kind of that honking, hacking, uh, a snorting sound that's that kind of like goes back inside. Um, and humans, we don't do that. Okay, so the first times us humans see one of our family members do that, then of course it's more disturbing. And th this, um, these, these seasons are nothing to necessarily to get excited about. They usually resolve themselves in a few minutes. It's again when you know you can have this ridiculous extreme. You know, it, you know, you should have hiccups for more than a few minutes or whatever, right? It's when it, it, that sneezing goes on almost acutely and that. 
So that's when it could be a, a real a health concern, but probably not. Okay. Uh, we do recommend sticking with your pet if they have uh, that reverse sneeze, because you never know. Um, we, we teach in our trainings, you know, you, our pets, they tend to get worse. They don't tend to get better when we're dealing with first aid. So the thing is, um, all dogs and cats, they can do that reverse sneeze, but it is the, the, the longer breeded, longer breeded, longer snouted breeds, um, they have a greater predisposition to having the reverse sneeze. And uh, cats actually do it naturally, and they use it to kind of clear their airway out, okay? Um, so medication is not usually prescribed for reverse sneeze here. I just want to throw that in, um, unless it's due to, you know, an allergy, you know, so they get an antihistamine or uh, some kind of maybe decongestant or something like that. And again, Pet Tech advocates keeping a pet health journal just for things like this, because sometimes it's only through time that you can pick these things up. I mean, how many times have you seen like a, a slow-mo video or, or like a, a, a through time video when they watch the, the plant just grow and stuff like that? I've always loved those as a kid, those fast and slow motion uh, pictures like that. So, however, just like with seizure that we teach in our trainings, the first time the pet has this, they should be checked out by the veterinarian to make sure that there's no, there's no true medical cause because nasal tumors can grow quickly and they can start that right up away and that's like where did this start from so getting a baseline with your vets is one of the things that we always teach and providing ad adequate documentation there is what veterinarians like to see as well so let me get my screens going up here so a uh, noisy breathing you know um we have an english springer spaniel where's my girl tini um tandoori a lot of you have met tandoori um her snoring does not bother me come here can you, can you get in the camera come here up, up, up. A little faster, stand the pressure there. Oh, is that right? All right, she's done. <laughs> uh, but, uh, but, you know, Tandoori, when she's in that deep sleep, snoring like that, I know that she's okay. And, you know, Siberian Huskies, Bulldogs, Dalmatians, you know, Pugs especially, they have that predisposition, predisposition to that noisy breathing. And the thing is, there's two reasons, tend, tend to be two reasons for this noisy breathing. And it's time for a pop of cavalry quiz. Just kidding. We have vocabulary for you now, okay? And that's, what's the meaning of strider? That, uh, in, that, that's the one question that we, that's one thing we teach inside of our trainings. It's a high pitched sound resulting from an area obstruction, which is our, our class here. And it's made on both inhalation <laughs> and exhalation, <sighs> out, okay? So that's the difference between strider and the next one we'll be telling you about. Um, so back in the noisy breathing, the second one is called stirter, okay? And it's common in brachycephalic breeds and then some older or overweight pets as well. So what's the meaning of stirter? This is, this is different. Um, this is a low pitched or that snore like sound. Okay. And um, it's a result of the fluids or, or flabby or loose tissue or whatnot that's causing this one here. And it's only during inhalation that we get this sound. So the two vocabulary words we've had so far are strider and stirter. Okay. And we're right along just finishing off with the noisy breathing. Um, you know, when some dogs get excited, they can present noisy breathing. I, I know that, um, we had a neighbor across the street and I swear the couch was only 10 feet from the door. And I used to go up and chat with the guy, his old retired attorney, he was really cool. And uh, the, the pugs loved me. They must know who I was, right? And when I'd come to the door, they would <laughs> and it, it, it sounded like a farm <laughs> or something because there's so much noisy breathing. And that's that brachycephalic pet that tends to be noisy breathing. And, and then as, as when it comes to the medical as well, um, you know, asthma. And have noisy breathing that would be something that we definitely would not ignore as well so um the next category we're talking about is feeding and elimination so i don't have my chat box up so let me see if i can't grab that and then um jamie or whatnot is there anyone was there any questions or chats so far i've just got one and that was kind of in um regards to the reverse sneezing sure. um if the dog is reverse sneezing excessively, so for example, that you gave due to the hairspray um, from getting ready to work, is there, a, like, what is the best approach on how to clear that or clean it? Or what would you suggest? Well, it's about information. Um, uh, you know, we can't diagnose from the front of our classroom as we teach, and it's hard to do that from here. So really, whenever we talk about something going on with a pet, we look at internal and external. Is it an environmental thing? Is there something in the environment that is causing this in the dogs? Um, one of the, we have a Knowing Your Pet's Health uh, book I wrote somewhat time ago or whatnot, but one of the things we talk about in there is that pets live in the most toxic part of our home. They live in the bottom 18 inches. 
I know you've all seen um, like pictures of s smog and whatnot in Smell A, and uh, you know how it's all dark, it's like that, you know, and then it gets darker and darker as it gets out of the ground. Well, our houses and our rooms and our boarding facilities are just like that. And if we had a mass spectrometer, we could probably see it, but we just can't see it with the naked eye. So our pets are in the most dense, most poisonous, you know, niche, if you will, of, of our home. And so the first thing we do is to rule out any kind of environmental things that are going on. It could be as simple as, you know, uh, moving away from, you know, especially petroleum-based products for cleaning and whatnot, and moving towards more like vinegar or, or something like that. Um, so that, that could be one of the things. Does a dog have an allergy? I mean, it could be an allergy too. And again, then, like we said, the veterinary could maybe give a decongestant or antihistamine and, and things like that. Does that help? I think they were looking more for, um, like, once they're in the reverse sneezing, is there anything they could do to help them get out of it quicker? Or uh, I think that's kind of more along the lines of the question. Sure, sure. Okay. The number one thing is, like, again, like we teach in our class, is get control of yourself. Because pets right. operate at a greater bandwidth. So if you go, oh, my God, your heart rate goes up, your tone and tonality just went up, your blood pressure just went up, and your pet looks at you and goes, oh, hello. <laughs> what is going on? Do I need to be rin tin tin here? Do I need to step up and be alpha dog or what, whatever? And so you put more stress on the pet. So take a breath, calm yourself and stick with the dog and let them go through it. Same thing with seizure. You know, you don't want to run in there because we don't know the level of consciousness are in there with the seizure. But when it comes to that reverse needs, just, just support them, reduce the stimulation, let them work through it. It's going to run, it's, it's going to run itself out in less than a minute or whatnot. They're going to have like an MO, a modus operandi. They're going to have a, a, a way that they have it. Same way of seizure. So they have a seizure for 30 minutes, or 30 minutes, not really, 30 seconds or a minute, and then it goes away and they're tired to take a nap and then they're fine. Same thing with the first sneeze. It tends to be the same thing. If they just normally have a sneezing fit for, you know, uh, 20, 30 seconds, you know, and then it goes away, well, there's probably nothing to worry about. I uh, would check the environment and is it food or whatever or something that's causing that. Um, but if it becomes chronic, or acute where they just they reverse sneeze and then stop the reverse sneeze and they just can't seem to break it or hack it um then that would be checked by the veterinarian so like that but there's nothing you can really do to help bring it to a, a close sooner it has to run its course but the course but you can make the course longer by the way that you respond does that make sense that's awesome thank you so much tom sure. Not a problem. Let me pop back to um, so we're at feeding elimination. And any questions? Um, just let me know. I my I, I have my screen I can look at uh, up here, so it's hard to see my uh, chat box. Um, but next up is feeding elimination. You know that just makes sense. It's, it's what we're putting into our pets. You know, so you never want to ignore, as we have on the screen there. You know, excessive drinking, increased appetite. You know, they're not eating or drinking, or peeing or pooping changes, unusual stool or urine. These are the things that we're looking at. Um, when it comes to our pets, because these are can be some of the first telltale signs that something is not right with your pet. So if you notice that you pet, you know, you're filling your pet's water bowl more than usual, then they could be drinking more water, which could be an early sign of a health of a health issue. And we have several stories like that in our training uh, of, of people who have used our snout to tail to do that. Um, it's probably not going to be psychological that they're drinking. It's like, oh, I think I'm in the Sahara Desert and I want to be thirsty. <laughs> uh, it's probably because it's spending time outside, outdoors. It's really hot outside. Um, it could be the food they're eating, you know, wet food or dry food. You know, wet food's 80% water is what you're paying for. While dry food's like less than less than 10%. And then raw food would be somewhere in between those, depending on, oops, sorry. Um, uh, depending on the format of your, your raw food, like what we feed, our tandoori is, is kind of wet. Um, or it could become a medical issue um, that the pet has diabetes and, or one of these other medical conditions we have listed there that could cause excessive thirst. So, um, um, I, I think we're doing good on time. I, I did want to punch this, this story out. Um, it's one of my favorite ones. When I did the Knowing Your Pet's Health book back in 2001, and it was in Dear Abby, um, uh, we used to have that book of pet sitters and stuff like that and used to hand it out. They used to give it out to new clients and client appreciation and whatnot. And this one this pet sitter was in my class and she came in and she had been using the book and she told me that she, a new client, she gave him the book and then she took the book right back and opened it to the middle because that's where the snout to tail assessment was. And um, uh, 
she started doing a stunt tail assessment on the people's cat. And they were like, whoa, we, we can't even touch our cat like that. <laughs> and they were, they were surprised at that. And then she, when she gets to the end of it, she goes, so, you know, your cat is dehydrated. And the, the owners go, her cat's not dehydrated. It's drinking more water than ever. <laughs> ding, 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 warning sign, right? And so this is where I respect her as a professional pet sitter. Because she says to them, she goes, look, she goes, before I take care of your pet, she goes, I want you to have a stress-free vacation. So, you know, I want you, while you're gone, not worry about your pet. So before you leave, I would like to have the pet have a physical. And they were like, indignant. They were like, none of the other pet sitters we've interviewed had did anything like that. Now, which one would you want more? Someone just comes in and goes, oh, I love that little guy like this here. Or someone who does methodically, you know, the vital snout to tail assessment, et cetera. Which would you rather have as your, as your pet sitter? So anywho, she, they go back and forth and she just realizes she's up against a brick wall. These people are not gonna take her pet, uh, her cat to, to the vet for a physical. So this is where she cared more about the pet than that person. Because she goes, take the cat to my vet. She goes, if it gets a clean bill of health, I will pay for it. If it does not clean, get a clean bill of health, she goes, of course you can pay for it. And then we can work together so that you can still take your vacation and have a stress-free, worry-free vacation, not worrying about your cat if there's something wrong with it. And they're like, deal. They thought they're getting a free physical. And it came back with early stage of diabetes. Well, now I heard like from her like six months after that, she said, OMG. She goes, these are the clients that you want. She goes, they're like bird dogs. <laughs> they find clients for her. They, they are like guerrilla marketing. They like, you know, you shouldn't have anyone else take care of your pet but this person. I mean, that's the kind of, that's a kind of loyalty that you want to build up in your pet care business because you don't just take care of the pet. You take care of the kitchen sink and the whole house too. So um, next one is going to be uh, increased appetite. You know, if the pet's begging more or eating too fast or wanting more, you know, some breeds kind of do that anyway. Um, but it could be because, you know, they, they start being fed too much or the amount of food or it's a poor diet. Um, there's several things that can come in to, to factor this, you know, um, but psychologically, you know, pets eat their feelings too. If they're bored and depressed or under stress, they, they can just want to munch and crunch, right? Um, and then an unbalanced diet, you know, overfeeding. Um, I have in my notes secondhand marijuana because I, had, I can't tell you how many classes I have taught where marijuana has come up into the class. Uh, not physically, <laughs> but the topic. Um, we had somebody who uh, the secondhand smoke, the dog got the munchies and got into the cabinet and they ate all this stuff out of the cabinet and they had to take them to the vet. I was like, oh my word, it was just, uh, it was just uh, kind of interesting. But so many things can lead to increased appetite. Um, it can range in severity. Uh, so like if it's a medical condition, you know, it could be hypoglycemia or something like that. Both those hypo and hyper can cause, you know, increased appetite. Um, like when Tandoori, when we switched her to raw food some time ago, man, oh man, she was like on the secondhand marijuana or something. She had like, crunchies and munchies. I mean, she just was, even though she loved her, her raw food, she, it, it, it wasn't like the crunchy kibble she had before. So we resolved that by giving her like just carrots. And now that is all great. It's a little bit more uh, roughage and fiber for her. So it, it works out pretty well. And we use those in the evening um, to do a little training and games and fun with her. So it's a little more mental stimulation because uh, we do mention a little later in the presentation that they need mental and physical stimulation as well. Um, now from eating too much to not enough, <laughs> or none at all, um, which are true warning signs of illness or disease. Um, you know, if the pet doesn't want to eat its food, I would say let's, let's, let's step back and take a wider view of the picture. I'll draw some the screen, how's that? Okay, and make sure the food is good. You know, I mean, there are so many food recalls every day. So make sure the food is good. Give it the smell test, smell the food and make sure it's, it's still good. Make sure it hasn't expired. I know Cindy just recently bought something at the grocery store, and when she came home, it was like expired. We're like, how did that happen? I mean, I don't check expiration dates on stuff. I mean, our grocery store is so busy, they flip their inventory like crazy. Um, so make sure it's not expired or recalled. And you can do that um, at FDA.gov, um, our, our federal website, FDA, Food and Drug Administration.gov. And um, uh, you can just kind of pack your way through there and you can find all the food recalls. And we did that just a week ago and there was already, there were something like seven pet food recalls that we hadn't heard about yet. And then a couple of days later, we heard them in our news and blogs and things that we had heard. 
Um, you know, then again, you know, psychologically, it could just be a finicky eater, AKA cat, right? Um, just be a finicky eater. And um, I, I know this is a little tangent here, but uh, I was reading the newspaper this morning. Uh, I think it's the, the aquarium in Japan, but ahi tuna is really expensive and that's what they feed the penguins. And so they go, well, we, we can't afford that. And uh, so they wanted to feed them mackerel. Well, the penguins would have none of that. So the penguins were starting to starve because they wouldn't eat the mackerel. So they had to go, I think they're going back to the ahi or they're going to raise the rates <laughs> for, the, um, uh, for the aquarium. Okay. Also, um, you know, situational, it can be a new environment, you know, or a current environment that's changed that they may not want to eat. You know, something could be different in that regard. Um, and then in regards to the medical issue, I mean, it could be something physical like a, a, a dental disease, like gum disease or whatnot, or a broken tooth, plus the other things we have uh, lined out there. It could be something along that line. Um, not drinking. Here we are back uh, with the too much or not enough, right? But pets in general need about one ounce of water per pound per day. It's just as a general guideline. Now that can go up or down depending on their age, their activity level, you know, several variables or factors or whatnot can come into play with, with that. But if they're not drinking, they can become dehydrated. So we always say that you want to have a constant supply of cool, fresh, clean water available at all times. And we actually filter our water both for ourselves and for our, our pets. Um, and in, I know in our my knowing your pets health, I used to talk about uh, getting the water checked all the time. You can do that for the veteran government as well. Um, a situational, I'm sorry, psychological. Um, it's like Keanu, our cat, he's napping right now, so we won't get a chance to see him. Uh, but today is trash day, so I think we're going to thread the needle on the trash truck because it's only about 20 feet from my uh, presentation here. So if they come, it'll be like the plane's flying over, we'll go quiet. <laughs> um, but on trash day, Keanu hides out all day. He doesn't touch his food, he doesn't touch his water. There's something about that vibration of that truck. He, he don't dig it. Okay. Um, you know, again, type of... Uh, type of food, situational, something like that. And then a nausea is a big one. You know, nausea can suppress uh, the, the urge to drink, drink as well. Um, and let me get to my next one here. Oops. Yeah, love hearing whoops. Oh boy, peeing and pooping. We love that. Um, so now we're on to about like, we're talking about what went in. Now we need to talk about like what comes out or doesn't come out. <laughs> um, you know, changes in your pet's routine um, shouldn't be ignored because what's the frequency or infrequency? Are they peeing too much? You know, Tandoori, we have our, our regular little trip. You know, get up in the morning, I bring her to the office next door. You know, she does her business and we trot back. Cindy takes her for a forced march um, of four or five miles every day, you know, and so that, that's a little routine. I, I know we had a little couple things uh, a couple weeks ago. It was like she didn't go and whatnot, and we kind of figured it out there. Um, but as far as the definition goes for constipation, that means no peeing or pooping for 48 to 72 hours. Okay, so there is a quite a, a buffer or window that we have, you know, for um, uh, for for them you know, going and all that kind of stuff. Um, now, one of my favorite parts. I know a lot of my instructors have heard me do this one here, but you know, we have in our we have in the medical world we have it's called a gross examination. You know, like the pet throws up and we go, hey, that's really gross. Let me examine it. And what we're talking about a gross examination is what we can do with our five senses. You know, what does it look like? What does it smell like? What's its texture, consistency? You don't taste it, okay? Just check on that one. Um, and uh, so what can you tell? Because like if it was rat, you know, rat bait, they color that on purpose. So that, because, you know, when it comes to medical things like this, time is our biggest enemy. So, you know, we wanna make sure that we can uh, get these things in, okay? Separation anxiety can definitely, uh, cause changes in their elimination habits as well. And then food ingredients and allergies, because manufacturers, pet meat manufacturers, they change their ingredients all the time. So it may not, I mean, you might be thinking you're buying the same bag of dog food or, or cat food or whatnot, uh, but it may or may not be, okay? And that change, those changes can affect the pet, you know, either with diarrhea or with constipation, it, 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 would, it would depend, okay? Also, medically speaking, I mean, it could be something as simple or, or, or maybe as normal medical condition as a, as a UTI, uh, urinary tract infection, which is easily treated, but if left uncared for, because you didn't notice it, you know, it can cause some really, some really serious problems. Um, so, my, let me check it. 
Yes, changes of movement. Hey, I th this is our, we're starting our next section here on changes of movement about mobility and range of, range of use and movement. Um, are there any questions? How are we doing in chat chat? Yeah, everything looks good, Tom. You can continue. Well, they're being too nice. They're just like not, you know, what was it? My other, my older brother used to tell me, he goes, hey, stop talking when I interrupt. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, that's kind of where I'm at. So uh, let's just talk about changes in movement. You know, I'm sure most of them know about our snout to tail assessment. And that's where you go from snout to tail with deliberate intent and purpose, creating a baseline for what's normal, blah, blah, blah. However, we also teach you know, this is not six feet, not like that toby stuff. <laughs> uh, but taking a look at the pet from a distance, you know, what what is their gait? You know, what how do they walk? How do they carry themselves? Bird's eye view, looking at the pet straight down, you know, and how do they look? I mean, since Tandori's gone on the um, a raw food diet and whatnot, I mean, she's got the hourglass figure. She's really trim. Uh, she's sleeping better. Her, her mouth is so much better brushing her teeth. Oh, my word. Uh, we would have made the change even sooner than we did. Um, so, so changes of movement and mobility and range of use and movement, we want to know, we need to get a baseline of that so we know what's normal. Um, and then lethargy or weakness, what, what's up with that? Not much movement at all. Or there's a kind of lack of balance or uh, uncoordinated movement. Um, I know I was teaching, this is a long, long time ago, I haven't told this story in a little while. Um, uh, I was teaching at Gross, I was teaching at Mercy Hospital in San Diego because I was affiliate faculty there. And this is cool because I got to use their incredible, incredible um, uh, um, meeting room that had, at that time, it had the TV with the biggest tube that they could make at the time. That's how old we are. And they had uh, chairs that were actually made by Lazy Boy. <laughs> and uh, so, it, I mean, it was really deluxe. And they let me use that room for free to teach my pet saver training, CPR and first aid, for eight hours, um, like once, one Saturday a month. And all I had to do was let two of their the people who bring the dogs in for companion and visiting and that stuff like that i said that two other people take my class for free so that was a heck of a deal but i remember that class so well because i taught there for so long and i remember this guy coming in and I'm, we're talking about south to tail and range of use and a movement and um he goes he raised his hand he's like tom you almost didn't come to class today i'm like there's no refunds i'm just kidding um I, he goes i'm just going to class because i you know, went to get out of bed and my dog had a hard time getting out of bed I had to help him down, and then he, you know, he started kind of, kind of gimping around a little bit, and he's kind of like, and then he seemed fine. He goes, my girl's friend's over with him now, and so I, he, he's okay. I just checked in. He goes, do you think my dog's getting old? <laughs> Again, you can't diagnose from the class. And so, like, I just, power of questions. I believe that so much, Tony Robbins. And I said, um, I go, well, how old is your dog? And he goes, like, five or six, as I remember. And I'm like, that's not that old, really. And then um, I, I go, well, what's the breed? And I remember him saying something like an Australian Shepherd or something like that. I go, that thing should be bouncing off the walls, you know? And so just, you know, I don't know, I, was, I got lucky, power of the universe, and I had one more question pop into my head. And I go, well, what did you do yesterday? And he goes, oh, he goes, since I knew I was going to be in class, you know, all day with you, he goes, I took my dog to Dog Beach, and we must have played like fetch for just hours. And the realization, I watched him, the realization just came over his face about he had just overextended his dog is all he had done at dog beach and that's what our classes are about is opening up awareness we, our classes are not the end all of, of anything we hope it opens a door so that you can discover more kind of like this presentation here you know some of these things here is like yeah i i read about it but i never looked at them too seriously but you know some of these things can be um serious or whatnot so um uh I have my note here about my pet health journal. It's like, you know, we can't remember what we did yesterday. So we really need to have a pet health journal to record this stuff so you can keep it through time. So that was, a, I think that's more of an inside joke for me because Cindy and I were working on something and I was like, was that yesterday? We, I couldn't even remember when we had done this other stuff. Okay. So mobility of range and use of movement. You know, in our snout to tail assessment, we talk about, you know, what's the range of use of movement, you know, helping to, you know, mobilize them and that. So mobility issues are generally not psychological, so to say, but unfortunately over 60% of our pets are overweight, you know, which can cause mobility and range of use issues as well. You know, but uh, medically speaking, if the cats or dogs are having a hard time jumping up or down, difficulty squatting or lift their leg, uh, can't find a position of comfort, then they may have, you know, arthritis, um, hip dysplasia, herniated disc. There's several things that could come into play um, that, that they have there. Oh, hello. Yeah, 
I love this. I love, you have to love tech until you don't. <laughs> it's, it's, it's uh, popping on here. So uh, lethargy and or weakness, um, any abrupt or unexplained changes in a pet's energy level and social engagement is something to investigate and document and record. So you know when it started, that's really important. Uh, as I said, time is our biggest enemy. Um, you know, but pets need mental uh, and physical stimulation on a daily basis, because if they're bored or depressed, they become lethargic, hey, why get up? It's not worth it, blah, blah, blah. You know, they have normal mental dialogue that they go through. Um, and also certain medications uh, can cause a pet to become weak and listless, you know? So that's, um, that could be one of the things. Let me get to my notes. Mm -hmm. Oh, a thyroid can affect it too. So it can affect your energy levels and stuff like that. Um, loss of balance or uncoordinated movement and just warning sign, warning sign. We have a vocabulary word coming up here. Um, but loss of balance or uncoordinated movement, you know, anytime a pet stumbles or loses its balance without explanation is a cause for concern. Now, I, I know that uh, it was like less than a year ago, we got a new mattress. Well, that new mattress is like four inches higher than our old one. And it was so funny because like for the, for the next five days, Tandori was thinking she's jumping up in the old bed. Her front end would go up and the back end wouldn't. And she's like, <laughs> what's up with this? And then finally she, she's swift. Uh, she, she figured it out, you know. But anytime a pet stumbles or loses its balance kind of thing, you know, especially like I said, without explanation, you know, that's cause for concern. But when you see a pet that is, um, the wording would be more like wobbly or, or off balance, the word that comes to mind in the pet industry is called ataxia. And ataxia is a noun, it's that uncoordinated gait, and it's actually an, a, an affliction of the nervous system that, that's affected by it, okay? And like some of the signs of ataxia is like, there's this exaggerated high stepping kind of gait, uh, tremors, a wide base stand in the back end, kind of like they're, they're just trying to keep their balance in line. Okay. Uh, so that loss of balance, you know, the, the cause is probably not psychologically there, but situationally, you know, pets that experience, you know, uh, they have like unwitnessed force blunt trauma. A, a, a friend of mine, his, his dog got injured and he came back and he's like, what's wrong with my dog? He's like walking back across the yard. And, um, I don't exactly know what the injury was. Shouldn't have brought that up. Uh, but he was like, what's, and then he had taken to the vet. He had been hurt. So I, I don't recall that one there very well. Uh, but they may initially present with like difficulty walking and whatnot if they have uh, unwitnessed blunt force trauma, internal injury, like being hit by a car or falling out of a tree or, or you know, people messing with animals. Um, also ear infections under the medical side, those also can, can cause that loss of balance or, or dizziness, what we call it for us humans there. Okay, cool. Hey, I, we're, uh, Jamie, we're at another uh, uh, big talking point there, the more big guys to never ignore. How are we doing? Any questions or whatnot? Or do we have them all in trance and they're like mesmerized? We do have one question here. Sure. Uh, is ataxia the same thing we see when a dog stands facing the wall or presses their head up against the wall or other hard surfaces repeatedly? Yeah, there's like head and body tremors, that, that loss of balance as we talked about. Yeah, there's several. Um, so have you seen it? Uh, I, I actually have seen it myself. I'm not yeah. sure if the um, person asking the question has. Oh, cool. Yeah, that, that's the thing. It's kind of like the first time you see somebody have a seizure, you know, or a pet, you know, have a seizure or something like that. Or even that reverse sneeze. It can be kind of like, ah, you know, even shocking or whatnot. So, yeah, this is definitely something that would be, you know, um, we're on the way to the vet <laughs> Let, and let's get a baseline. Okay. And, and did, did that answer that for you, Jamie? Was there? I believe so. I haven't had a comment yet. Okay, cool. <laughs> I, I was letting you be the intermediary there. <laughs> Absolutely. Okay. So the cause on that is probably not psychological, you know, um, the, the pet may experience that, uh, long for some, I think I found it back to my own slide here. Let me get back here. Yikes. We're on behavior. It's my thing popping there. So uh, the, the behavior changes we're talking about here, sorry about that. Uh, changes in personality, vocal changes, changes in sleep habit, you know, biting, chewing, aggression, those all should never be ignored. Okay, so check on the time there, cool. Um, as dogs and cats move through the life stages, I did a life stages a webinar, I think last year or something. Um, not only their, their, their physicalness can change, but their personality can change. You know, a confident pet become insecure or a laid back pet and happy pet becomes anxious, stressed or whatnot. Um, so it's, you know, it's about those documenting that through their life. You know, the most fluffy, cuddly pet 
we teach in our in our class you know they can bite or scratch like Cujo you know which is why we teach restraint and muzzling in our training and I can't tell you how many groomers we've had in, that I've been in my class alone um, who have said oh that pet owner told me oh Fifi won't bite and she goes really <laughs> and she's like got an injured finger you know so like when Rio lost his eye you know he was actually a little more um, cautious and a little more a little more skittish than he was and and he had a pretty rough life so he was pretty cautious and whatnot um for being neurotic um but as we teach our trainings any pet that's in pain you're going to move it into pain they can and will bite and you know that's just purely reactionary we don't want you to think oh my pet doesn't love me anymore or anything like that it's just a reactionary um reactionary thing so um vocal changes this is where you should know <laughs> your pet's language okay at least the vocalizations um you know, we have a, a new baby in the neighborhood and they, they go for walks and they'll come along and I hear that baby crying and it sounds a lot like my cat Keanu sometimes, but I, I, we do know the difference, you know, especially um, you know, when, you, when you know the normal sounds of your pet, then you can more quickly recognize the not normal signs of the pet. And the difference would be kind of like the pitch could be up higher, the duration could be longer or shorter, the frequency of the vocalization can change, you know, um, it's kind of like you know the mom who can hear her baby like <laughs> out of a bunch of babies kind of thing you know it's part of our brains as well um so the bark and the bark and meow uh, tends to sound different when the pet gets excited stressed or in pain and pet parents tend tend to know that so um a cat's meowing your vocal sounds can change um you know dogs and pets can change with like home life changes such as divorce i know i was watching uh, uh, cnn a long time ago and Judge Judy was on there, and, I, and Cindy likes Judge Judy. And um, she was on there, and it was so weird because we we're in the pet business. And she goes, she was, she's handled so many divorces, and she said she's never seen people get more vicious than over their pets. You know, about having to like divide them and stuff like that. Well, there are family members, and they're chosen family members, right? Um, so, like a, a, a human or a pet death in the family, you know, can cause these changes. Um, really, the, the, the bottom line is that any significant emotional event, any significant emotional event to us is one to them too, because they get it from us as well. So vocal changes in dogs and cats, you signal an underlying health issue. I mean, it could be a tumor over there. So therefore we always say, don't take that lightly. Never under, underestimate any kind of lump, bump, or a cut, or a bruise, or whatever. Okay, um, change in sleep habits. I wish I could sleep as much as my dog or my cat, <laughs> but pets tend to sleep a lot. And uh, however, when you notice a change in the frequency or duration, because my cat, he's pretty good schedule there, or there's a different location of their multi-daily naps. You know, it's for you as a pet parent, it's time to wake up and smell the coffee. Something's not right with your pet. You know, like that, stress and anxiety, you know, can interrupt our sleep habits. Um, I didn't lose any sleep over uh, this one here, but I certainly woke up at four o'clock this morning because we have a neighbor. I was just telling a friend of mine that this morning. Uh, we have a neighbor with a diesel truck and he leaves for work at four o'clock. And uh, I, I hear that every morning. I can usually tend to go back to sleep, but TMI, too much about Tom. Okay, uh, and also as we get older, <laughs> we find it harder to go to sleep or to stay asleep. I think I'm, I feel like I'm starting to talk about myself here. This is like self therapy. Um, so, and then uh, thyroid issues can also change energy patterns, as we mentioned uh, uh, before as well. Uh, biting, chewing, aggression. You know, when a pet changes its behavior and it starts like walking circles or being to suddenly bite, chew, show signs of aggression, then that's definitely something that you won't ignore for long. <laughs> as I say, you know, we, we're very, we tend to be very patient. Uh, but the emotionally stressed uh, animals can begin to chew on like objects or something, or even themselves, uh, show aggression towards people or other animals, and, and even bite. I know when we traveled with Rio, um, we had to be careful with like the seasonal things between East Coast, West Coast, because sometimes we'd like start scratching back east. And, and again, you know, that could have been the cleaning supplies that they use in the convention halls. Because, I mean, Rio is in the bottom half of the worst 18 inches, uh, the most toxic 18 inches of, of your home. So that's one of the things that we had there. And then um, when it comes to medical, you know, any pet or in pain uh, or with arthritis, or something like that, they can be grumpy or aggressive, you know, but just because of that there. Okay, hey, Jamie, we have one more to go, skin and hair coat. 
Awesome. Wow, nice. uh, Tom, can I just quickly give the CEU uh, code for those that might have to leave before um, we're completed? We do have a question as well, which we'll wait till after you're done. But just for those that need the CEU code, um, it is CC2. Zero zero six one. Oh, thanks, Tom. Perfect. Well, because people are listening to. I apologize. Yeah. Oh no, that's all right. Just in case that anybody has to leave, that you'll have that CU code. We'll give it again at the end. But I just wanted to make sure that we got that before anybody else had to had to leave. Uh, thanks, Tom. Sorry. Go ahead. No worries. The last few minutes is just really boring. It's just a special announcement and stuff we have. So. But I'm but I'm tough crowd today. Um, skin and hair. The things to never ignore there is the. Uh, well, let me back up a second. I can't even talk about this category without bringing up our the pet text now to tail assessment. And I know we have a lot of instructors here and they're just probably just nodding their head along with me here. But what we teach is there's no part of your pet that you shouldn't be able to touch. And you should touch your pet every day with deliberate intent and purpose, especially using the pet text now to tail assessment. And remember to record those daily assessments and interactions in your pet health journal. So then you'd be able to notice that unusual odor through time, the, the, the hair quality or coat as it diminishes or whatnot. That bump, I, I know when I did my work at the Pet Emergency Specialty Center, this lady came in, this little tiny tumor she found, and three months later, the thing was almost the size of a golf ball. I was surprised how quick that took over. So, um, you know, it helps us to moderate those things through time, okay? And then our assessment also includes pet's vitals, the heart rate, the breathing rate, mucous membrane, color, and meaning, which can give us a little deeper underlying understanding of the pet's um, health. Okay, so the things that never ignore would be unusual odor, texture and quality, lumps and bumps, it's excessive shedding and hair loss. So I'm not saying your pet smells, but they do. <laughs> I know your pets, I mean, you know how your, your pet's breath smells, their ears, their body, you know, and unless it's unpleasant or unusual, it's all well and good, you know, and we teach you to, in our trainings, we teach you to use all of your senses when you're assessing your pet, um, because then, You'll find those things, and I, I smell, I always say, is the first one you're going to notice because that's the one, you, again, you're not going to want, you won't ignore it too long, okay? Um, you know, psychologically, it's probably not the reason. They might have some stinking thinking, but there's no psychological cause for having an unusual odor, you know? I think a good majority of pet parents also have Googled the recipe for how to remove a skunk smell uh, from my dog, right? Um, as unpleasant as that is, it's good that they know what that unpleasant smell is from, rather than like um, Rio had kidney disease at the end. And, you know, we were on top of that very quickly, but his breath did suddenly have this like sour smell for lack of a better term there, you know? And again, if you've ever smelled a yeast or an ear infection, uh, I would say you'd never forget it. You know, it's like the smell has no timeline on the smell. Um, you can just go right back to when that happened. Uh, but the, so the, uh, those things you wouldn't necessarily forget. Um, yeah, I have, I have a story I, I would like to tell, but I'm not going to tell it. Basically, the bottom line is it was a woman, uh, it was a groomer who smelled the dog. And uh, she said, hey, get the pet checked out. This went on for three months. And then finally, they discovered it was cancer. This lady smelled something wrong with this pet over three months before, actually long as six weeks of visit, um, uh, before it was you know, confirmed medically. Okay, texture and quality of the hair coat. You know, touching your pet has been proven to be good for you and for them. And a study by the American Heart Association since, uh, stated that in the first 10 seconds of you petting your pet, um, your blood pressure drops 10 points. And that's why I have two pets. <laughs> okay. And healthy skin should be supple, supple, clear, not greasy, flaky, or bumpy. And a healthy coat should be shiny, smooth, and not brittle or coarse. You know, unless that's their natural hair coat. Okay, psychologically, it would be stress that would do that would be like long term stress can affect the pet's overall health, you know, through time, including that quality and texture and, and, and that. Um, situational, poor diet is probably the number one reason that pets have, you know, dry, brittle, kind of uh, bumpy uh, things. Uh, medications and treatment, some of those can affect skin, dry out skin, uh, prematurely age it. It's uh, like cancer and it's, it's treatments is what we're talking about there in the column for, for medical. Uh, next one is the lumps and bumps. As with our self tail assessment, we say don't under, underestimate any lump or bump as the smallest tumor can grow, like I mentioned earlier. And um, I can't tell you how many students have done the self tail assessment and they found you know, cancer uh, 
they found dehydration, they found, found hot spots, and they found mites, they found things that they never with intent and purpose, you know, they petted their pet. They didn't go intent and purpose, you know, snout to tail. Um, you know, um, any lump or bump that's caused by like, you know, trauma, where's, where's my bumps? <laughs> uh, insect bites, tumors, anything like that, you know, should be checked, treated, and monitored by you in conjunction with your veterinarian, but keep your own records on your own, on your own pet health uh, journal, uh, if, if that makes sense. Um, there we go, cool. Um, and then one of the things on the, I was doing a speech at the King Charles Cavalier Club, and I just sold my little book that Knowing Your Pet Self. Well, two weeks later, they did the snout to tail assessment only from the book, not even a video, not even a, taking a class, and they found a, a nerve sheath tumor. And um, they actually, we have a, a testimonial from them, I think, somewhere on our website, because uh, the vet's like, man, no one ever finds a nerve sheath tumor. The first sign of a nerve sheath tumor is from the disability. It tends to be from the disability. And they were able to find it, and the dog has full range of use and movement and mobility. And so they were, they were, they loved us, <laughs> put it that way. Um, last one we have to talk about here, as far in this category, is excessive shedding and hair loss. You know, um, uh, you know, again, a change of environment, products we use in the home or the yards, diet, medication. Um, those tend to be the culprits, you know, for excessive shedding and that hair loss, um, the hot spots as well. But psychologically. Um, it can be related to prolonged emotional stress and anxiety. The, the things affect our pets through time for long-term pet wellness. And so, you know, we want to have a happy, healthy little home for our pets, and that's where we're going with that. Um, contact dermatitis. I know um, our son, we still kind of pet sit for a, uh, a dachshund in the neighborhood here. Um, we've had since he's been a little puppy, and it's a dachshund. And he, and he walks them through the yard over there, and I don't know what they use in the grass, but, you know, he gets little rashes and stuff on his stomach. You know, and then um, unfortunately, chronic disease and that again can be can cause uh, this kind of thing too. So as we get closer to the end here, we have a couple slides left. You know, we all want our pets to live a happy, healthy, and, and full life, right? And noticing the, the first signs, and then documenting that, it will let you know whether it's a one-off or it's like a persistent issue that needs to be addressed. So it's really about keeping those good records. And the signs and indicators, those are not islands. They can definitely Venn diagram, you know, like a spirograph, if you will. And, you know, and you really, you can't ignore them because one may present initially and then there's a whole bunch, they start to, like I said, um, spirograph you. Um, so they tend to get worse. So Pet Tech's motto is, you know, early detection means early intervention. And so with that being said, we're, we're actually making an announcement here. Our goal is for you to be in tune with your pets and that's where we're, we're so, we're excited. I, we've been working on this for so long. Um, on our new canine and feline health journals, um, they'll be available September, 2022. Um, you can go to our website there at healthpettech.net forward slash health journal. And we have a really nice description there for you. Even if you want, you can, um, if you're on our mailing list, we will let you know about the, about an early, you know, how you'd be able to get it and all that kind of stuff there. But the journal allows you to like easily and conveniently keep track of your pets, you know, daily routines and the health records. And I mean, every client should have, have mm -hmm. one of these. So pettech.net is where we want to go with that. And then for your CEUs, again, for those that are listening on the FM dial, uh, CC220061, CC220061 for one CEU credit there. And um, I appreciate your time. I, I, we, a big thanks to you. Uh, Jamie and Pat and all of you here today for helping us with our mission of preventing one pet ER visit because I know mm -hmm. that someone learned one thing here today that will help their pets. This was an awesome presentation. <laughs> Thank you so much, Tom. We do have one question uh, just to finish up. I know uh, we're just a little bit over in time. Uh, yeah. So many of you may have to leave. Um, thanks for those that have joined. Thanks for those that will watch this uh, after. Um, but just one question um, from somebody um, oh, did I maybe write that? Kathy saying that the the link for the journal is not working. Yeah, you know what? We just had our web guy put it on this morning. We did not want to okay. put it up yet, but but you no, know, it, it was supposed to be up by ten thirty. Um, so just just try a little bit later today. I apologize for that. Um, it's a very nice description and stuff like that. And uh, yeah. Uh, That's and, super exciting. Those journals look amazing. But the last question before we let everybody go is. Uh, for pet parents that want to make a first aid kit at home, uh, what would be like your top must haves in the home or in the car um, to make a quick first aid kit um, to have with them on handy? 
Oh, you asked the wrong question. You asked the wrong <laughs> person. You asked the wrong person that question. Because yeah. if if all you have is a hammer, you treat everything like a nail. Okay. So we recommend that you put together your own pet first aid kit up to the level of your training, up to what's your activity level with your pet. I mean, Keanu, we take him for a walk. And I use that word loosely because his walk is from the back door to the front door, and that takes 15 minutes. <laughs> That's a catwalk. Okay, so we don't need a big first aid kit for him. So, but if you're out there doing uh, agility or you're doing things like that, then you definitely have to have your first aid uh, uh, supplies. And, and that would be just going to basic uh, bandaging. Uh, definitely have something to, um, I'm just kind of looking around here for my muscle. Um, the whole box of them right there, about thousands. <laughs> um, we want to have a muscle so that you can muscle and restraint so that you can then safely take care of the pet without harming the pet, the people around them, or you as a pet rescuer. So I don't really have like an itemized list. I'd be happy to do a webinar in the future with the top 20 items that should be in a pet first aid kit. The top oh, that'd be a great idea actually for the future. I love that idea, Tom. Look at that. But this is how things come out about, right? Just chat in and then, hey, that would be a great, a great webinar. That would be absolutely Goodness. fantastic. Goodness. I, I'm touring. <laughs> I love it. Um, also, another question that just came in, would you recommend doing nose to tails like daily or weekly? Would, I, mean, I, I always advocate daily for sure uh, for my own sure. clients, and my own pets, but what would you recommend? Well, daily and then um, like you know, before and after a hike before and after you're going out. I, I mean, the shortest story I can say on this one here is I remember taking our dogs to Dog Beach and within 20 minutes, they were both lamed up because all this tar was on the beach and mm -hmm. it took me hours to clean that out afterwards of two dogs. And uh, so I, that that's a dramatic, that's a ridiculous extreme as I say, but when you come back from a thing, a foxtail, Foxtails have made many Porsche payments for veterinarians, <laughs> as I like to say, um, you know, because they, that, those, those guys go in and they don't want to come back out. Um, I assisted with a surgery where the Foxtail was in the nostril, and that was one of the most bloodiest surgeries I'd seen, and I've seen some stuff. That was, that was nasty. So, yes. so uh, before and after activities that are outside, um, and then uh, uh, daily. Excellent, very good tip. Uh, thank you everyone for all of your questions, your interaction and just listening uh, and, and being here and part of um, uh, the instruction and the knowledge. Uh, every day we should learn something new. I, I, I say anyways that we should always learn something uh, new and people here uh, on the comments saying, thank you, Tom. Thank you so much. Uh, thank, you. thank you to PAC as well. Thank you instructors, Patrick, thank you. Absolutely. And all the instructors that are on too, that's absolutely incredible. I think that's super exciting. I took my course a few years ago and it was a, a fantastic course. So thank you again, Tom. Uh, for those that are um, still on, the CEO code is up still. And for those that will watch it again, we thank you very much for your support and we'll see you again on the next one. Thanks so much. Thank you all. Have a great week. Have a wonderful day. Bye-bye.